We're looking at a number of passages in the Bible that seem to say you've got to work your way into eternal life. One of those passages is in Galatians chapter 6. Of course, we've been talking about, you have to read the first five chapters first and see what Paul is saying in the next chapter, Galatians 6, because we've already established that Paul is established in Galatians 1 through 5 that justification is by faith alone. He castigates the Galatians who've been following the Judaizers that follow Paul around, trying to put the law back into the salvation message. And he, he said, no, it's by faith alone. Who? How did you get the Spirit except not by the law, but by faith alone? So when we get into Galatians chapter 6, and it says something that is, uh, if you ch pick, cherry pick that one verse out of context, you're in trouble. Galatians 6, 8 says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. That's a harvesting thing. It's an ongoing thing. You keep getting one crop after another and you keep harvesting it. Is that how you get eternal life? Well, we've been looking at this and other passages like this. Ephesians 5, 1 to 14. No immoral or impure person or covetous man or one who is an idolater, <clears throat> be he believer or unbeliever, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. So when you get to the kingdom of God because you got justified by faith alone, you don't get to enjoy owning an inheritance of the kingdom of God, part thereof. We look at the next passage, see how this goes, plays out. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 20. Believers who live unfaithful lives will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, you don't inherit the ownership of it. Getting in, residence is another thing. So let's keep going and seeing how we go through as we've already investigated these in previous YouTubes. Colossians 1, 9 to 12 and 21 to 23. Live a worthy life, and the believer will share in the inheritance of the kingdom of light. It's an inheritance, a co-rulership of. And the next one is Colossians 3, 23 to 24. Believers are to work for the Lord so that they will receive an inheritance as a reward when they gain entrance into heaven <clears throat> because they simply were justified by faith alone. So they get to heaven and they got stuff Call rulership rewards, ownership. Second Timothy two eleven to thirteen. If we believers endure, in other words, live faithful lives, we shall also reign with him. Call rulership. If we believers disown Christ's ownership of us while in our temporal lives, be unfaithful, he will disown our inheritance of reigning with him. Disown, take away what you could have owned. See. And in James 2, 1 to 5, God's sovereignty of choosing the poor to be heirs of the kingdom and believers' free will choice to persevere under trials unto the righteous life that God deserves resulting, that desires resulting in becoming an heir to the kingdom are both in view. So you, you persevere under trials unto the righteous life that God desires that will result in becoming an heir to the kingdom which are both in view. All right. Matthew 10, 32 to 33, 37 to 39. Take up your cross, remember that one, and be worthy. Confess and be confessed before the Father. Or deny and be denied your eternal inheritance, but never your gift of eternal life. You, can't do, you don't do something to get the gift of residence into life, into eternal life, into heaven. Uh, you do nothing but simply believe. You can enhance it, though, by being faithful once you do get the ticket to get into heaven, which is by faith alone. And we have the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 1 to 5, 9 to 12. The Beatitudes, the meek, those who are faithful shall inherit the earth, <laughs> actually inherit ownership of the earth. Now, you may be a resident there because you weren't all that faithful. So, there we go. Robert Wilkin has to say about this. Christians who lose their legacy, Galatians 5.21. The Lord himself is a perfect illustration of the truth of the Beatitudes. He was meek and poor in spirit, and he willful, willingly accepted persecution for righteousness' sake. As a result, he himself will inherit the earth and receive the kingdom, ownership of it, rulership over it. We have Beatitudes continued. And then we get into Galatians 5, 9, 19. 
to 21 verses Galatians 6, 7, 8, which we're continuing to examine the two. Compare Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes. New King James Version means selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and so on. And New King James Version says heresies, pretty good for both, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, all of these things of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you before, that these, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice it's an inheritance that you would receive when you get to there, your eternal destiny, which is secured by faith alone. In Galatians 6, 7, and 8, Do not be deceived, God is not marked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Since Galatians 5, 19 to 21 and Galatians 6, 7 to 8 are passages within the same book and within the same context, believers walking in the Spirit and answering their own internal inheritance versus believers walking in the flesh resulting in losing their inheritance of the kingdom of God. So, and since we have in view the one, a believer, who sows to please his sinful nature, who from that nature will reap corruption, as contrasted to the believer in 6.6 6 of Galatians, who sows, sows to please the Spirit, who from the Spirit will reap eternal life, then the expression rendered will reap corruption in Galatians 6.8 is parallel to not inheriting the kingdom in Galatians 5.2. Whatever corruption means in Galatians 6, 7, 8 must be parallel in meaning to what the phrase rendered will not inherit the kingdom means in Galatians 5.21. The word plethora rendered corruption in Galatians 6, 8 therefore refers to the ruin, the destruction, dissolution, deterioration, or corruption of all or part of one's enhanced eternal inheritance to be received in the eternal kingdom of God. On the other hand, according to Galatians 6, 8, the believer who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life in the sense of reaping an enhanced, enriched eternal life, i.e. an inheritance of the kingdom of God, receiving co-ownership and co-rulership of some kind within the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ enhanced by one's faithful sowing to the Spirit. These verses are dealing with something which believers reap for work done because salvation from hell in other words, inheriting eternal life is not a reward for work done. It is a free gift of one's eternal destiny with God. On the other hand, inheriting the eternal kingdom of God in Galatians 5.21 is equivalent to the continual repetitive reaping toward one's eternal life in Galatians 6.8, which had to do with enhancing or enriching the salvation from hell unto eternal life the individual first and forever received when he believed in Christ as a gift. Inheriting eternal life unto residence in the eternal kingdom of God is not the same thing as inheriting eternal ownership of that kingdom. Look at Romans 3.22b-24. to 24. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all who those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Note that in the context of Romans 3:21 to 24, the Greek word rendered are justified means are declared, established to be righteous by God unto salvation from hell with an immediate and present tense possession and inheritance of eternal life through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It couldn't be any clearer here. For by grace you have been saved, perfect tense, with the moment of faith, you've been saved from that moment on with ongoing present results forever. Perfect tense, with an infinitive. For by grace you have been saved through faith, from hell unto the heavenlies, Ephesians 2, 6. And that salvation, because it's neuter, it's not, and that faith, faith is feminine. So, and that salvation not, is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, and not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So what are these works that we do? Well, in Ephesians 2.10, it says, We are now his workmanship, dedicated to those good works. But once we got saved through faith alone as a gift, then you get rewarded. Hebrews 1.14, 1 
Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Those meaning those to whom the book of Hebrews is addressed, those who are holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, who are to consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession of faith in him. A faith in him, you inherit salvation. If you continue on in the faith, you inherit the kingdom of God and ownership, blessings, and eternal rewards. Luke 18:18. 18, 18, a ruler questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus put, answered, Put the keeping of the law or anything to, to do with good works not within the capacity of man. So the ruler went away without qualifying himself to inherit eternal life by his own doing by faithful godly works. Because he said in Luke 18, 19, let's check, check that out. He said, no one is good but God alone. So how can you do any good works if they're not good works? Because no man can claim to have good works because he's sinful until the resurrection. And then he gets the new resurrection body if he believes. Luke 18, 19. One more second here. I open it up to four windows. Yeah, four windows. Let's look up and see what Luke 18, 19 says. Luke 18, 19. Yeah, there it is. A ruler questioned him saying, Good teacher, let me blow it up a little bit. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus went to the point of his perception of who he was. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but except God alone. So the ruler is saying, what should I do? What things should I do? Well, you're not, a, you're not good. So if you do anything, it's not going to be acceptable as the righteousness of God's uh, in production for, toward your eternal life. That's why you need a, a Savior to do it all for you because he was perfect, died in the sins, uh, for the sins of the whole world, for your sins. You believe in that. He does the good works and gets you a gift of eternal life on the on that basis alone. So he went away sad, actually, because Jesus said later on, when Jesus heard this, all things I have kept from my youth, the young ruler bragged. One thing you still lack, Jesus told him, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And he went away sad. All things are impossible with people are possible with God. So, we have the answer. By grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Look at Mark 10, 17. Same story. Oops, now we can go back up. Mark 10, 17. As he, Jesus, was sitting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus is answering, verses 18 to 31, putting the, put the keeping of the law or anything to do with good works, not within the capacity of man. So the ruler went away without qualifying himself to inherit eternal life. These, these two are similar, the one in Luke and, and the one in Mark. Then at the end of the passage in, in Mark 10, 29 to 30, in the parallel passage in Matthew 19, 29, there is the implication in Jesus' answer that those who not only believe in the name of Jesus Christ for salvation, but who sacrifice for his name's sake for the cause of believing in him for eternal life, will not only receive eternal life, but will be rewarded many times what they sacrificed in their temporal lives. Give up all your wealth to follow me, and you'll have riches in heaven. Luke 10, 25 to 28. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he, Jesus, said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And the lawyer's answer, which Jesus affirmed afterwards, was as follows. And he, the lawyer, answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Whereupon the lawyer's answer implied his limiting his obligation to express godly agape and love to only his kind and not to a non-Jew, which Jesus responded to with, 
He, Jesus, said to him, You have 